Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. 16 states thus far have reported cases of coronavirus. North Carolina has one reported case. There are no reported cases in Virginia yet, but according to the Centers for Disease Control, it's not a matter of if, but when. The CDC says prevention is the best defense and urges all of us to take precautions. But what are those precautions? What are the symptoms? What is Virginia doing to prevent an outbreak? And how do we substitute knowledge for fear? Up next on Another View on Health, the facts about coronavirus and COVID-19. Stay tuned. Another View will be right back after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. What started in China has spread all around the world, and the United States has not been spared. Coronavirus and COVID-19 has all of us concerned, and there are plenty of rumors out there about the virus and the disease it causes. We want to give you the facts so that you can take preventative measures to protect your family and your loved ones as well as yourself. Joining us to talk about coronavirus is Dr. Todd Wagner, Health Director for the Western Tidewater Health District. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Pardon me. Larry Hill, Public Information Officer for the Virginia Department of Health's Eastern Region. How are you doing, Larry? Great. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. And it's good to see you after all it's these years. Been a long, long time, It's friends. been a while. Absolutely. And joining us by phone is Dr. Alvin Harris. Harris, he is an internist and he's working with the Virginia Department of Corrections. How are you doing, Dr. Harris? Glad to be with you today, Bob. So happy you're with us, too. Absolutely. So I want to start, gentlemen, by let's just get down to the basics. And Dr. Wagner, I'm going to come to you first. Okay, Okay, let's talk about what is coronavirus and what is COVID-19 and what's the difference? Yeah, the coronavirus is a, you know, is a a group of viruses. Uh, Most familiar to most people is the same virus that causes the common cold. So you might be familiar with that. COVID is a name we we gave to this particular virus. Every new virus, novel virus, as we call them, Mm -hmm. that comes out gets a name because there are varieties of coronavirus. So we want to make sure that we Uh name that virus to be able to differentiate it from some of the others. But Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how that came about. Very similar to uh, I know the audience probably heard of SARS and some of these other viruses that are of similar uh, type of virus, but uh, they they have a different name naming convention. So that's why when people on Facebook were talking about on the Lysol Little can, cans. you saw the word, you know, uh, eliminates coronavirus. Correct. But those are different strains Correct. of that coronavirus. That was before we knew of this coronavirus that we we're talking about today. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was likely to be talking about more the the type of virus that causes the common cold. Yeah. So, but same, mm-hmm. same family of viruses. Mm-hmm. Yes. So. so what are the symptoms? How do we know if we have um, Typically you will usually see a fever in these, um, you know, sometimes people are relatively a- asymptomatic or don't have a lot of symptoms with the disease, but when they do declare themselves, typically we see a fever. Um, don't, necessarily know how high or low that fever will be, will be, but a person either feels or can take their temperature and has a fever, mm-hmm. cough, and then eventually shortness of breath. And usually in the um, the older population, say above 60, we'll see uh, more significant symptoms, you know, probably uh, more shortness of breath, a little mm-hmm. more, um, you know, but you'll always see usually um, fever, uh, shortness of breath and cough is mm-hmm. another one that you usually see with the disease. So, but but that sounds like the flu. That sounds like a cold. That sounds yeah. like the upper respiratory yeah. infection. I'm just getting over. It, How do you know the difference? How, when do you say, hmm, I better go check this yeah. out and see if, if I, this I is. I think you've hit a nail on the head. It, it is very difficult to differentiate. And they do have very similar um, uh, symptoms that they that they bring forward in all those diseases you brought uh, forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and ultimately, you know, testing would def- differentiate between the, between those groups that you just spoke of. Uh, but you really wouldn't necessarily know the difference um, 
by symptoms alone. So, mm. yeah. Mm. So. Dr. Harris, I know that you're working with the uh, Department of Corrections right now, and you've got a, a rather isolated group of folks that you're you're providing medical care for. But you've also uh, practiced um, on a private basis and so forth. What are you hearing from people about coronavirus and about what their concern is? Because the information that's being distributed is new. And because oftentimes the public hears the word, so many people died, there's almost a bit of hysteria. And that's why on the administrative side, there's been a lot of talk to try to say calmness. But we must be careful because on the one hand, we don't want anyone to get trapped up in hysteria to the point that they're scared to death. But on the other hand, one must be very vigilant. Mm -hmm. The key to this whole process is, as and is, monitor how your body feels and do not be afraid to go to see your doctor if you're concerned about changes in your body temperature or cough that doesn't go away and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So why do you think, um, and I'm going to ask this of both doctors, and Larry, I'm coming to you, but why do you think, um, Dr. Harris, that there is such a panic over this when, you know, we've had SARS, we've had the flu. I mean, we've had other diseases that have affected a lot of people. Um, but I don't recall the the nervousness, if you will, that this one seems to be causing. Well, one of the problems is the fact that it's almost mystical in the sense that it is new. It has rapidly appeared amongst us. We know that the Chinese over in China is where it started. And yet, like many uh, infectious diseases, it is slowly but surely creeping into our population. And we're looking over our shoulders. We're being vigilant, but we're not absolutely sure what parameters to measure and how to make an accurate diagnosis in time to save our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's the aspect that is generating the hysteria. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dr. Wagner. And I would agree with Dr. Harris. I, you know, I think it's the newness of it and it's the unknown. You know, any time uh, novel, as we call them, novel, new mm-hmm. viruses, we we don't know a lot about it as, as the situation unfolds and and patients present and we take care of people. We learn a lot more about the disease. There's there's lots of studies going underway uh, that are underway now with with uh, in, in, in China, you know, dealing with the cases that we've that we've seen previous mm-hmm. and, and we're learning more and more, but it is new. There's a lot of unknown. And, and I think that does um, tend to, 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 to rev up the, you know, the, the hysteria, if you will, that you, that you hear a lot mm-hmm. of times with, with new viruses, but uh, we, we have a, a revolving series of new viruses frequently. It's not new. There's always questions being asked initially, H1N1, for example, we went through that, I guess it's been nine or 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And now that's part of our regular flu pattern every year. And we, as public health professionals, still keep our eye on it, but the public doesn't talk about it as much, but it still exists. But that just shows you that when it's new, when it's evolving, when it's unknown, coming from a a far, you know, a location far away, it it tends to to rev up people's... uh, And there's no vaccine yet. Correct. No vaccine. uh, No, no... And we can talk about that, you know, no treatment per se, you know, that you have uh, things, you know, Tylenol and things that you can use to, 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 to curb fevers and things. But there's no there's no overt uh, treatment for it that we can use right? or for, no vaccine. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to join our conversation. What questions do you have about coronavirus, about COVID-19, about how you can take preventative measures to keep from catching it. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Larry, I want to talk to you about communication because obviously that's your job is to communicate out to the public um, the information that they need to know. But how are you combating all of the rumors and and the the negative things that are being said or or propagated as truth? versus the information that, that scientists and, the, and that your doctors know to this point? That's a good question because we're, we're seeing the rumors out there and we're seeing the, some misinformation out there, in, in the, especially in the social media side of it. Um, 
there's many of us communicators from the state health department working 24 hours a day right now, working on the messaging, following what's going on. Uh, we're working closely with the hospital public affairs folks, the school systems, the um, city and county PIOs, and mm -hmm. they're actually helping helping us in the same way that they're monitoring stuff and they see something wrong. They're they're letting us know um, the messaging, like like Dr. Wagner's doing right now, staying consistent with it. It was really important with us. Uh, we're sending all our information out daily to everybody. Um, one of the big challenges that we are having right now is that things are changing every day. Yeah. So we're having to stay on top of it. So we refer a lot of our inquiries to our, our, our website because that updates numbers and the new information every day now, the, the www.vdh.virginia slash coronavirus uh, mm -hmm. information site. So there are rumors. There's also people who are making calls sometimes to the media that aren't true, that it's taken up our time to follow up on those. Uh, so there's, there's stuff that we're, we're doing behind the scenes a lot more than people really know. I got a uh, post from um, on Facebook uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, or maybe the day before. But it says, um, good evening, uh, Facebook friends and family. I just got a call from a friend of mine. Her husband works for the CDC. He said, do not get food from any farmer's market, nor eat wings and stuff from Chinese restaurants, because they, all, they get all of their food from China, where the coronavirus outbreak is. Please be careful and spread the word. Dr. Harris, is that helpful? I'm coming to you too, Dr. Wagner. No, it is not helpful. It's misinformation. One of the things that we must be very aware of is the mode of transmission. And remember, the biggest problem with this virus is by way of droplets transmitted by way of cough. And oftentimes, it's the person who is nearest you doing the coughing. So in that sense, it's not going to be transmitted in food. It's going to be transmitted by droplets of cough, unprotected, uncovered, that is transmitted into the air or things along that line. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Wagner? No, I completely agree. And, and and also I'd add there's been some, I've seen some questions and some concerns posted about things like water supplies and things like that. As, as Dr. Harris alluded to, this is a this is a droplet transmission, meaning, you know, within six feet, rather large droplets coming from a cough or a sneeze, things like that. Food, water, those kinds of concerns just are are not valid and they and they you know, perpetuate a lot of the fears and, and concerns people have unnecessarily, frankly. There's they should focus on the things they can do, which I know Yeah, we're gonna and we're you, gonna talk about you know, that. Some been of those hearing things, a lot of yeah. and, and simply worrying about those other things distracts from what you really need to be doing. And so. we also need to be careful too, because we don't want to demonize any particular group and particularly Absolutely. um since our focus is on the African American community and we know what demonization can do yeah. to a community and it's not fair to to um, um, subject our Chinese brothers and sisters in a in a way that is not Absolutely. causing you know this this issue. Absolutely, right. that, that's a big Larry. That's the biggest concern for the communication side of it. Stigmatization is a big deal on this stuff, and stuff that's uh, Chinese related right now is probably getting stigmatized and say don't do this, don't do that, and that's some of the things that we have concerns about. Yeah, we need to work on that. Uh, Anita joins us from Moyak, North Carolina. Hi, Anita, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, I'm getting ready to board a plane. I have my hand sanitizer and my disinfectant wipes for the tray and the seat uh, belt buckle. But I was wondering if I should wear my face mask. Okay, let's let Dr. Wagner answer that one. Yeah, a lot of a lot of questions out there about face masks. They're 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 really not indicated. The only people we really want uh, to utilize face masks are those people typically in in healthcare settings. Um, um, certainly the things you're doing, hand sanitization, uh, you know, trying to distance yourself as best you can in an airplane. I recognize it's <laughs> difficult it's to close, do, but yeah. as, as best you can. Um, but, uh, you know, frequent hand washing as, as, as often as you can. Um, you know, I, I, the masks are not indicated at this at this point. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Yeah. Harris, you want to take that one on, too? Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh one of the things that's really interesting is uh, when she gets on the plane and and does her little sanitation, sit in her seat and relax. And oftentimes the person to your right and the person to your left 
is going to be just as well as you are and have not been exposed to any infectious type processes. The person in the way in the back of the plane who may cough, uh, that droplet is not going to make it to the front in the first place. But more importantly, right now, our environments are relatively safe, and hopefully we will be able to keep it that way. Okay. Nita, I hope that helps you. Thanks so much for the call. We appreciate it. It does. Thank you. Okay. Why? How come it hasn't come to Virginia yet? Um, I don't know if I can <laughs> specifically answer that, but I will say it's really, on wood. I, I would say it's really more of a question of not, not it, 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 when. It, when. It, it, it will. It's being community propagated, as we call it now. It's spreading in communities. You can look at the map each day. I do for the, that the CDC puts out and, and it keeps, the colors keep changing on various states. So there, we will likely have a, a reported case soon. Um, you know, it uh, I can't say when or a specific timeline, mm -hmm. but um, I, we will see cases. And so that's why we're talking about it, trying to kind of get ahead of it, think, have people thinking about what they can do. I know public health officials, such as myself, emergency response people, um, are all, you know, sort of thinking about the what ifs and, and mm -hmm. what could happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that that's happening. But, um, you know, the, the, the prediction of a virus movement is, is very difficult. But with the, the, the community spread, I, I think we can safely say it's, and, and you've heard the words even from the CDC also, that uh, it, again, is not a question, but if, but when, you know, we, we will get cases. Okay. Uh, uh, Ahab? Joins us from Virginia Beach. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. What's your question? So my comment is uh, my wife and I <clears throat> have flu-like symptoms. She went to an urgent care facility. I went to a local clinic. Both facilities don't have any test kit for the coronavirus. Even so, our symptoms just match what you described earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're wondering probably, you know, why why there wasn't testing or, or yeah, based on, you know, when we take a, um, you know, when we look at a patient or evaluate a patient and look at, you know, their travel history, the signs and symptoms they're having, um, there's a certain algorithm you work down to decide if you're going to test because, as was mentioned earlier, the signs and symptoms that you're showing could could be a variety of things. So to test without a, a, a travel history, um, you know, to a particular area or, or from a particular area without that would not, uh, would not really indicate testing. So. Can you can you test for other stuff as a, as an elimination? You, you kind of certainly process? can. You can test for flu. You can test for RSV. We call it. Uh, uh, you can test for other respiratory viruses. And and but in a lot of cases, um, you know, flu you you can test for and and is likely tested can be tested for to kind of rule out those things. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in the in the coronavirus currently. All testing is being done centrally at the state of Richmond. At some point, it may work its way into into commercial labs, but at this point, all testing goes through the state of Richmond. But but that has uh, initially it was all going to the CDC itself to be tested. That's now at the state level, which was which is definitely expedited okay. uh, the the timeline of testing. But so but if a doctor go, if yeah. a doctor wants you to be tested, then you would have to go to Richmond. No, that, you don't have or? to physically go to Richmond. It would uh -huh. be evaluated. Um, those cases are being run through the public health departments to say, yeah, this person meets criteria or, or they don't meet criteria so for the, testing. So the health department, then you're actually monitoring some people now, is Absolutely, that right? Absolutely, yeah. We call okay. persons under uh, under investigation is what it's called and mm -hmm. we're, we're watching them to make sure if they've traveled from areas or they're coming back from an area such as, mm -hmm. say, Italy, we're wa monitoring, making sure that mm -hmm. they're not, you know, having signs and symptoms. But, um, but as far as the testing, uh, you know, testing in every case wouldn't necessarily be warranted mm -hmm. and i suspect you know i don't know the particulars of that you know that interaction mm -hmm. but I, I think that's what probably occurred dr harris what would you tell ahab to do then for he and his wife should they just treat their symptoms as they would treat any other type flu symptoms at this point i would tell them that the watchword in this process is index of suspicion that is always the key in the diagnosis of any ailment and just as just was described, index of suspicion. If you've been to a place where there's been exposure in Italy, China, 
or been around someone who has been exposed or on a journey of that nature, then you could think, yes, maybe. But if you've been basically just to the local drugstore, and there's the fact that in the state of Virginia so far, we're clean, then I wouldn't worry that much. I would treat it as a common cold or flu-like and, and, and hope and pray and, 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 and get better. Uh, sometimes when you hear hoofbeats, don't think of zebras. Always look for horses. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Ab, I hope that helps, and I hope you feel better. Thanks so much for the call. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So, Dr. Wagner, what do we need to do in terms of taking preventive measures? I'd say the first thing, and we've touched on it already, is to remain calm. But if you're talking about specifics of, of uh, prevention, I think the biggest thing are those, those again, copious hand washings, the coughing into a Kleenex or into your, into your sleeve and your elbow to not propagate those droplets that we talked about talked about and a big thing uh people well, let me ask you yeah. a question about sure, that sure. because somebody brought that up and i uh-huh. just thought about it um they were saying that if you cough into your elbow then the droplets get on your clothes and you could get it from that no uh, it's it's okay. really not gonna play that, that up. way yeah it's the <laughs> droplets working their way into the respiratory tract of somebody else is really what we're worried about and that that elbow, though not necessarily perhaps perfect, is much better than just, uh, just coughing. <laughs> coughing into the air or sneezing into the air. The last thing I was going to mention is just, um, you know, if you're feeling ill and is has been described by a couple of our callers, you know, do not go to work. Do not go to school because, you know, any time, whether it's flu, cold, you know, COVID-19, it just that helps us from spreading that disease. We don't, you know, if you don't necessarily do not need to go in and, and expose others, I guess is what I'm getting at there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and those are the big things. Um, and you know, making sure that, uh, you know, just taking care of yourself. Um, and if you need, you know, if it, if it continues or you feel like, um, you know, you're not getting better, obviously consult with your, with your healthcare, uh, team, you know, there's also, uh, I was going to, um, make sure that all your callers had the number. Uh, there's a number 1-800-531-8722. And that's a 211 number for the state of Virginia. If they have Say it one more time, uh, 1-800-531-8722. Mm-hmm. And it's a, a 211 system. And as Larry mentioned, also the VDH website, there's lots of good information there, but they're um, like, um, you know, like this show, you can ask questions, you know, both uh, providers, medical providers, and the public can call that number to to, to ask to get further information. Absolutely, and and your local mm-hmm. health department. I I you know you have local health departments both uh, here in Norfolk in the Virginia Beach. I work out in the Suffolk area. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's always a local public health department. If you go to that VDH website, it'll narrow you down. So where put you in need your, to go. put in your zip code, and it'll give you your local public health department, and you can touch base with them if you if you if you do still have concerns or Mm -hmm. questions absolutely dr harris you're working with the department of corrections Uh, if there were to be an outbreak um within the the um incarceration system would that be easy to to control or or more difficult i mean in other words because you'd have to isolate people right oh of course um one one of the major concerns is uh cleanliness is next Mm -hmm. to godliness so we make a concerted effort to make sure that our environment is scrubbed down, is clean, that we make it aware for our patient inmates, and we show a caring attitude that is calming, reassuring, and we try to make sure that any visitors that come through, that we have a general idea of anyone who's had foreign travel recently or things of that nature. Mm. Okay, so, so you are screening the visitors, good. yeah. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. Okay, 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. We're talking about the facts of coronavirus and ways to protect yourself. Our guests include internist Dr. Alvin Hill, Dr. Todd Wagner, Health Director for Weston Tidewater Health District, and Larry Hill, Public Information Officer for the Virginia Department of Health's Eastern Region. Um, We got a call from Richard from Hampton. He had to hang up, but... um, 
He wanted to know, he said, we're hearing a lot about symptoms, but could what could you share, Dr. Wagner, the major signs um, are were of people who have died from this disease? In other words, was there something else going on? I noticed that yeah. mainly we hear about seniors yeah. as opposed to other populations. And about 80% of the, the cases of significant or severe illness are, are in ages 60 and above patients. Um, so certainly the elderly patients would, as I described earlier, have uh, tend to, th- those have been the cases that, that have had the most deaths for mm-hmm. sure. Um, those with immune compromise and other medical compounding medical issues uh, would would also be involved uh, in those cases. But um, certainly the the elderly are, are are more predisposed as they are with other respiratory illnesses such as mm-hmm. the flu and, and and the like. So, so that yeah. could be a complication with that and other diseases. Absolutely, that they may that yeah they may potentially have. in the in the we call them comorbid or or other conditions that they have going on, mm-hmm. whether it be heart conditions or diabetes or other things that um, that may may affect their health. So, Dr. Yeah. Harris, should people get a flu shot now? Even even now, even though that it won't it won't counteract um, coronavirus or COVID nineteen, but is it important to just still get your flu shot so that perhaps you can avoid any of the other types of coronaviruses that are out there? <laughs> if available, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If available, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but re- remembering one basic fact that there's not going to be a panacea to prevent them from getting this process. And don't go to your doctor and say, give me an antibiotic to save me from this process. Yeah. We're talking about a viral infection, not a bacterial one. And for some reason, the public has a tendency to think that antibiotics is the cure all. To anything that's respiratory or infectious in nature. Mm, so this yeah. is the one you got to ride out. Yeah. There's no, <laughs> there's no, there's no an- yeah. antibiotics going to help that. Our phone lines are lit up, so let's go to the phones. Jennifer joins us from Newport News. Hi, Jennifer. You're on the air. Hi. Mike, uh, when you were discussing why people are upset about this particular disease, mm-hmm. we know that it strikes a particular subgroup. And any time you have a subgroup, whether it be racial, uh, age, or whatever, people are going to get more worried about it. And um, one statistic that I'm sure is available but is not being put out there is among people over um, 60 that have been tested or they, you know, that people know that they had the coronavirus, what percentage of those become critical and die? We know that the that the percentage is, it's probably right. The percentage is lower for the general population than what we know, because some people don't get it very seriously. But I think Mm -hmm. in general, seniors probably get it more seriously. And nobody's been telling seniors what percent of seniors die or become critical if they're, if they get the coronavirus. I know that statistics out there. Okay, let's let the doctors respond. Dr. Yeah, Wagner? I don't know if uh, I can recite a specific statistic on that. I know there's a, a much higher prevalence of of deaths in the in the elderly population, as, as you've alluded to. Um, and that's why in long-term care facilities and things like that, there's there's always a, a you know, a bigger, there's, there's always a, a concentration or, you know, certainly a, a vested effort in trying to, to, to keep those patients, uh, you know, from getting ill. But, but certainly in this case, I know there these facilities and I've talked with lots of them are going to even extra lengths to make sure that their facilities is, as Dr. Harrison mentioned, uh, are clean, uh, that, you know, uh, patients that are ill are, are segregated from the rest of the population, um, and, and things like that. But, uh, certainly we are always more in tune to the, um, to the fact that elderly patients will will have can have more severe symptoms, which you know could in some cases lead to death in mm-hmm. in a variety of illness, same, in a variety of respiratory illnesses, like I mentioned, influenza, same thing, uh, coronavirus, same thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, let's go to Mark in Hampton. Hi, Mark. You're on the air. Hello, hello everyone. Hi. Um, I just had a simple uh, simple question. Um, you said that the court, you know, um, just worry about the droplets, you know, the person next to you on either side. 
Uh, well, I was just kind of wondering about, you know, uh, pre-cooked food and post-cooked food. You know, somebody coughs on the food, and how long how long does that last? Or maybe it doesn't have any, you know, effect at all. Yeah. Okay, Mark, let's get an answer from the doctor. Thank you, Dr. Wagner yeah, and, uh, no, and Dr. As Harris. Was, as was mentioned earlier, the uh, you know, a lot of the survival of the virus on on surfaces, even if it's if it's food or the like, has a lot to do with temperature and humidity, but really the passing of the virus through through food is not a a, a, a normal mechanism at all, as is in water is another one that often gets asked as I as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, and certainly if a, if an item is cooked, that's going to definitely, you know, Kill solve, whatever. So, solve the problem right there mm-hmm. for sure. Um, but even on, you know, it's, 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 it's a period of, you know, uh, minutes to, you know, that, that the virus can survive on a surface and it, it, that's temperature and humidity dependent, but, um, uh, food and water would not be a concern. So. Okay. Uh, Allison joins us from Norfolk. Hi, Allison. You're on the air. Hi. 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 Thanks for taking my call. Sure. So I work in an office. Um, it's like an outpatient doctor's office. And we were just wondering if we should have um, environmental services, wipe down surfaces, doorknobs, desks, those kind of things. I personally think that's always a good idea. Again, and for a variety of respiratory illnesses, is is mm-hmm. you know that that sanitation is is always a good idea because some some viruses are a little more hardy than others. So I think uh, it's always good to to do that. Uh, additionally, I don't know if your your clinic or where you work has a has an area at the front for, for hand sanitizers and things for people as they come in. I know a lot of people are carrying them now, but nonetheless, a, a station up front, you know, kind of uh, check before people come in or an opportunity for them um, to have that before they come in your building. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, let's talk to Tom in Elizabeth City. Hi, Tom, you're on the air. Thank you. Yes, I heard on this very radio station the other day from BBC News that they suggested that rather than go straight to a doctor if you suspect you have this uh, virus, that you call health officials first for advice because then you'll lessen the chance of spread into medical facilities or lessen your chance of getting uh, an infection of something else that will complicate your case. Do you recommend that? Yeah, I mean, that it, that's a that certainly is a mechanism to do that before you do go in and expose others to it. But I'd also caveat that with, you know, if you're feeling ill enough to think you need to seek care, then, and it's been prolonged and you've been kind of waiting and trying the normal things to get better, you know, I can't advise you not to go in either. But there's certainly, um, as I mentioned before, uh, your 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 doctor's office, your and the public health uh, lines that I that I mentioned is is certainly not a bad place to start either. Could to kind of narrow it down to kind of maybe alleviate some of your concerns before you expose before you exposed others. But uh, yeah. thanks for the call, Tom. We appreciate that, Doctor Harris. I want to ask you a question. I'm thinking about um, Katrina in the sense of how there was such a concentrated area of low-income people um, in New Orleans um, who who didn't have transportation, who didn't necessarily uh, listen to shows like this and to pay attention to media and, and so forth. And Larry, I want to ask you also, but are, are we concerned that there may be populations that aren't getting this information? And if so, how do we get it to them? Absolutely. Um, The best way is to continue to saturate the airway and the communities with positive information of this nature. If we can continue to spread the word, Mm -hmm. activate the great band, many people will get the word. They may exaggerate a bit, but it may stimulate others to find the correct answers and to spread the word even more. So amongst those who do not have computers at home and and means in which they can get the direct information, our great brand and our communities will make a major difference mm-hmm. in overall outcome. Are you speaking like are you going out to like churches and and other community groups and so forth 
um, Dr. Harrison and Larry, I'm going to talk to you about that too. In the rural areas in which I live, yes. every place I go, I take the word with me because it's almost like spreading a little sunshine. It helps alleviate <laughs> anxieties and fears, and it helps people even stimulate them to research and to think about things that ordinarily they wouldn't think of. Mm-hmm. What are they telling you when you're talking to them about it? They say the, the, the major concern that everyone has is that people are dying. And as you would see on any news broadcast, for the most part, they always give you a death count. Mm-hmm. And it's out of that death count that generates fear. Because people have a tendency to think, gosh, anybody that gets this, this is horrible. They're going to die. Well, right. not exactly. And, and out of that, we can use the positive aspects of this process to spread correct news and not fake news. Exactly. If I could Go jump ahead. in yeah. on that, mm-hmm. this is Dr. Wagner sure. again. But uh, just to echo that, we have to keep in mind, and I don't want to be a, a bear of bad news, but you think about the flu. There are hundreds of people in Virginia alone that die each year of the flu. And it's not to you know, distract from, from coronavirus, but uh, I, I just want to r- remind people of yeah. that. And, and people don't get as spun up about that. Um, so I think we need to, to, to yeah, think that, about that. That kind of goes to my question I was right. asking about earlier, because it just seems like there's such a yeah. concern about this it's, where the you know flu takes people yeah. out often. Yeah, I mean, thousands of people in the United States yeah. um, die each year, hundreds in, in Virginia. So, uh, yeah, it's... Larry, what 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 else are you all doing besides talking to each other? Obviously, to make sure you have the most up to date information. But but how are you reaching these hard to reach populations to make sure they have the right information? And that's a good question. And one of the things that we do, it's part of our, our response plans for this, is that we do reach out different ways to the communities. Uh, we meet with the faith based communities a lot. Uh, and reach folks that just yeah. like mm-hmm. Dr. Harrison, I was saying that that people may be in rural areas or or, or don't come to do other areas or, or follow the computer stuff. Mm-hmm. So we reach out to faith-based areas. And also what we don't talk about is about the different languages people are speaking. We are very, very um, good at reaching out to these different communities. We, matter of fact, right now we do have materials that we have available in different languages in regards mm-hmm. to this. So that that's if something, if somebody needs that, just reach out to the health departments. We can try to help you with that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some of the different communities, like where's uh, maybe the Filipino, Filipino community or an African American community. We have folks that that have the trust factors that we can go in and yeah. and work with those folks and let us speak and talk about things. And people reach out to us because of that. So our plan is based on that to to be able to reach the the folks that are hard to reach. One more thing that we haven't really talked on more is we really reach work closely with organizations connected to the the nursing homes the long-term care facilities and all Mm -hmm. same thing we we reach out to them they they're not going to always be on computers or or seeing everything that's going on so we reach out to them too yeah i would i would echo too and the you know i can speak for the public health department's aspect Mm -hmm. we're in those communities every day we make connections not through coronavirus or others but we're there we're 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 talking about you know other things we're educating people on and those same nurses those same educators are out giving this message out too it's it's related to coronavirus and and the like but we have those relationships developed with as larry mentioned the the long-term care facilities the faith-based organizations the schools and things and they're like oh you want to talk about coronavirus that's great we'll, we'll do that you know and we, so we we take our relationships and we utilize those to bring a topic a topical you know information to them about a, a recent you know concern so what about your healthcare workers mm-hmm. i mean at some point <laughs> do yeah. you guys this is all new to you too i mean sure. you're, you're learning as as everybody else is mm-hmm. is learning um how do you keep the the calm factor for the healthcare workers and how are they dealing with this from from that perspective? Yeah, I think there is a you know there's a concern and a, it's a it's a justifiable concern. We saw a lot of of cases in China with large cases as people um, um, you know a lot of healthcare workers became ill, mm-hmm. but we need to protect our healthcare workers. I can tell you in our system. Uh, the systems we're working with, um, you know, Centera and the, and the like here in this area, there's uh, 
lots of training going on on how to use respiratory protection equipment, respiratory precautions that we utilize frequently in hospitals and healthcare settings. We're always training, training, training on that, retraining, re-educating. Um, and so, yeah, the, the concern, you want to be concerned, but again, as we've mentioned, uh, not panicked, I guess, is the word I would use. So we want our, our folks to be trained. We want them to understand. We want them to be protected with the right equipment. And they're doing that. And, um, you know, if, if you do that, it, it you know, you think of, um, I saw an example of, of, of SARS virus that came over. The city of Vancouver had, had, had a case come in. Their, their, their uh, reaction of their healthcare workers was pristine mm-hmm. and no other, there was one nurse that was affected and she had, uh, had not utilized eye protection and the droplets got in, they can go mm-hmm. into your eyes too, um, juxtaposed or put against a example of Toronto where there were not good uh, protection measures put in. Mm-hmm. There were hundreds of cases that developed, uh, and this was during the SARS virus, amongst healthcare workers. So that's kind of the tale of two cities, if you will, okay, that shows if you protect your healthcare workers, if they're trained, if they do what they're trained to do, they, they can be protected. Mm-hmm. They, we, we, we have a way to protect ourselves if this, and we're, and we're going to be confronted. We're going to see people sick with this, with this virus. So we just need this and this and other viruses. You know. We need to protect ourselves. You know, I tell you, it's, it's, it's a little disconcerting though, when you see everybody completely gowned, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and I guess the whole idea of keeping the compassion for yeah. the patient while you still take, you have to protect yourself. So you're not trying to say, Oh, you're a monster. Cause you have all this yeah. stuff going on. Um, you know, but you have to wear all that gear and so forth. But at the same time, reassure that patient that they're, yeah, you know, little, they're going to get the best care they can. It's a little different interaction. I know you don't see the <laughs> smile. You don't see the yeah. the handshake. Maybe it, it's, it's a little different. And, but you know, there's still, I, I know lots of people that can wear protective equipment that can certainly still be compassionate. So, uh, you know, I, I understand what, you're saying it's a little like a, you know a little little different interaction mm-hmm. there with your providers that are in that that equipment but i think you would understand they're you know in the environment they're working they don't know um and they're trying to you know you want them to be there to take care of lots of people right so we want them to be protected absolutely david joins us from norfolk hi david you're on the air david oh yeah hi. you're I'm on the sorry. air yeah, um, I, I just wanted somebody brought up that they had heard on the BBC that they didn't want people to go into the doctor's offices or into the hospital if they thought they might have got it. Right, and they would the say that you should works, call first. Yeah, they have a number, I think it's 111, not that that matters. And they call that, and then if they can drive themselves, they drive themselves to the hospital to the parking lot, a certain parking lot area, and people come out there and meet with them and do a test on them if necessary. So it avoids them going into the hospital or into the doctor's office where they may, if they've got it, you know, uh, infect other people. Ah, I and see. That, and that's how that works. I just thought I would you know, clarify that. that. You know that. Thank you, David. Yeah, I, don't know do, I don't know if we could do it here or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know. Okay, thanks for the clarification. We appreciate that. So we only have about six minutes left or five minutes now, Lisa just tells me. So, Dr. Harris, what is the most important thing you want people to walk away with from this conversation today? Be vigilant. Watch your body, your body temperature, your environment. Spread the word uh, correctly. No fake news. And uh, do not be afraid. Um, mankind has survived for ages. We will survive this too. And the best part about it is we will learn a lot in the process. Fantastic. Dr. Wagner. Yeah, I would echo that. And then the only other thing I would add is this is, uh, everyone has a role to play in this, in this response, if you will. Um, and, and that was touched on a minute ago, the things we can do. Um, but you know, it's 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 a team effort here. Certainly, our healthcare professionals, our our public health professionals, are taking a, an upfront leadership role in this. But it it's all it's it's over to all of us to do those little things that we've talked about today to to protect our community, mm-hmm. to think about others. Um, you know, stay vigilant yet remain calm. You know, you don't uh, and getting 
getting unnecessary communications, unnecessary uh, panic does not help any of us. And I think uh, yeah, it's sometimes that, you got to turn the social that, media it's off. It's that balancing act of, <laughs> of kind of staying, you know, being aware, but mm-hmm. not being over. And Larry, I'm going to ask you, is there, because there's so much information out there, where would you tell people to go for reliable information? Two places. Uh, the VDH website, the coronavirus page. Mm-hmm. That, up, that website's updated daily at, between 10 and 11 o'clock every day. So all the, all the new information is coming out every day. Mm-hmm. And the other one's the CDC. So that's the Virginia, Virginia Department of Health website. Right. Okay. You, you didn't know what? Can you say the whole thing? Okay, here we go. <laughs> www.vdh. Dot Virginia, the entire word, uh-huh. dot gov. gov slash coronavirus. There we go. And coronavirus is one word, folks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Coronavirus is one word. And the, and the other thing I want to say, lastly, is, is thank you for inviting us on the show to help sure. us get the information out. We, yeah. we really thank appreciate you. the help. Absolutely. Not a problem. Um, are there... Let's see, Lisa, you're just telling me, oh, we have a question from a caller who wants to know what kind of quarantine practices are in place to keep people who've been exposed from traveling. Quarantine practices. Are there, um, there aren't any in Virginia at this no, point, No, there right? are not. We are, you know, there are uh, volunteer isolation when people come back from affected areas within a, a periodicity or a time frame that mm-hmm. that may we want to watch them as they come back from those those high volume areas but um there are no mandated quarantines or isolations there's so we're nothing. not saying you can't go correct anywhere. correct it's um you know it is a it is a volunteer voluntary self-isolation you know so at, the, at this point and mm-hmm. don't uh don't you know plan on that changing anytime soon so. okay and the other website was the cdc larry correct www.cdc.gov they, they post things daily as well so those are the two trusted sites that where you can go to get the, the most information Absolutely. that you need dr harris are you uh fist bumping or are you shaking hands <laughs> Still shaking hands. You still shaking hands? <laughs> still shaking hands. I'm shaking what hands. about you, Doctor? I'm shaking hands. And who we are and what we do, and uh-huh. because of that, uh, uh, until remember, when you hear hoof beats, don't look for zebras. And uh, you know, the medical community, the professionals, we're going to stay on top of this, and and the majority of the public is going to be safe. And the, and the key to the whole process is that we be vigilant, don't get hysteric, and practice good common sense in your day-to-day living. Well, you can't get any more basic than that. That's Dr. Alvin Hill. Thank you to Harris, rather. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Are you fist bumping or are you uh, shaking hands, I'm Dr. I'm shaking Wagner? hands, but I do like a good fist, or a good, uh, fist bump. <laughs> I, I, I'm not opposed to a good fist bump, but I, I don't have a problem shaking hands. Okay, that's Dr. Todd Wagner. And Larry, are you shaking hands or are you fist bumping? High five. <laughs> High five. And there you go. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much. This information has been very valuable. And if you know of other people who need to hear this, our podcast will be listed on our website. We'll tell you where to find that in just a bit. And we will be right back. Hi, this is Essie Patha Merkerson from Law & Order. You are listening to Another View. See, whenever Todd wants me to smile, he just plays Law and Order because they know that's my favorite show on the planet. Anyway, (laughs) welcome back, everyone. From the mid-70s until 2000, you couldn't flip through the pages of Essence magazine without catching a glimpse of editor-in-chief Susan Taylor. Her vibrant smile, flawless skin, and beautiful braids were an Essence staple, and Taylor was the driving force. But she left the magazine to devote more time to her other passion, her foundation for at risk children. Our Lisa Godley recently spoke to Taylor about life after Essence and the message of empowerment she'll deliver when she visits Hampton Roads for a women's conference on March 14th. 
Susan Taylor has always been passionate about empowering women, especially African-American women, and she's been doing just that since her early 20s. That's when she took the plunge as an entrepreneur and created her own line of beauty products for black women. While the line did well, Susan wanted more. And when the 23-year-old Taylor learned Essence Magazine was looking for a beauty editor, she went for it and got the job. She would spend the next three decades at Essence delivering information on the latest fashion and makeup trends, coupled with messages that informed and empowered readers. But when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, Susan wanted to do more and established Essence Cares. She says it was a lot to do both and something had to give. When I learned that 80% of black fourth graders were reading below grade level, that's when I decided that it was time for me to leave the magazine. I learned so much at Essence, and everything that I learned, I imparted to the younger ones around me. But my community needed me, so that had me make my exit and build the National Cares Mentoring Movement. Taylor says she works diligently to get more African-American men and women to give up their time. Our children need to see us. They need to know that we care about them and that we're not going to let them fall or fail. And so over the last 14, 15 years, we've recruited over 175,000 mentors. We've trained them and deployed them to schools where they serve as mentors and reading buddies and tutors and to community support programs for children and then also to detention centers. Taylor says since National Cares began, she's witnessed transformations that would make your heart sink, like former gang members and drug dealers becoming college graduates. Taylor is passionate about helping those around her change for the better, whether they're teenage boys heading down the wrong path or grown women who want to make better life choices. We know that advancing our community really rests a lot on our shoulders. And we can't do the work that we have to do for ourselves, for our family, or for our people if we're not healthy, if we're not positive, and if we're not strong. And when she speaks at Portsmouth's Grove Church for their women's conference, she plans to cover everything from building strong relationships to forgiveness. But most importantly, learning to take care of ourselves. You have to give to yourself before you give yourself away. But that's not our tradition. It's not our practice. It's not what we've been taught to do. We've been taught to put everybody's needs before our own, and it's cost us greatly. If we look at the illnesses that cause early death and Lord knows so many debilitating diseases. And what I love about life is we can always change. So what I'm going to speak to women about and really speaking to myself about is choosing again, choosing what's good for us without hesitation and without apology. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And Taylor is the keynote speaker for the 2020 Prayer, Passion, and Purpose Conference that will be held Saturday, March 14th from 9 until 3 at Grove Church in Portsmouth. For more information, email waosk at grovechurchvia.com. And waosk stands for We Are Our Sister's Keeper. Please take the information you learned today to heart and wash your hands, steer clear of rumors, and check trusted sources like the website for the Virginia Department of Health and the Center for Disease Control. Now is not the time to panic, but to stay well informed. And I encourage you to share this broadcast with your friends and loved ones. Visit our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. Next week on Another View, it's the Another View Roundtable, lively conversation on current events affecting the African-American community. Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer, and Todd Washburn is our audio engineer. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Have a fantastic weekend, everyone, and be sure to join us next Thursday at noon for another view.